What about Mark 16, 16, which, which clearly says, my friend, okay, you know, Mr. <laughs> Apologetic Dog, chew on this, all right? Mark 16, 16, all right? Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned, okay? Again, it's a nice flowery explanation you gave, but it seems like you are adding to the text when the text clearly says look right whoever believes and is baptized but whoever does not believe will be condemned i mean it seems like you are adding to the word of god uh mr dog <laughs> okay mr apologetic dog that's that's what i would get um is that's not what it says that's not what it says and we're saying time out we're talking yep. about its meaning yeah, that's, that's, that's why. I, that's why I'm trying yeah. my best impression of. You're doing person. great. <laughs> so I have two different answers depending on what I guess your your context. We got to make sure we read the whole verse, right? Mm -hmm. Because Church of Christ are really good at proof texting. We got a list here. They will say all day long, whoever believes and coordinating conjunction is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mm -hmm. There's the key. Right, it's the believing and the unbelieving or not believing is what saves and condemns. When you let the whole verse speak. Okay. Now we still have a give, give an account for and is baptized. Well, it doesn't equally say whoever does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. But you could say whoever believes and goes to church will be saved. That's what Christians do. Okay. Whoever believes and reads their Bible will be saved. That's it's indicative. It's showing what believers do, and we know that it's the the not believing. Is what's going to ultimately end up in our um, being condemned. Dr. White would take a different approach and says, "Bro, this is the longer ending of Mark; shouldn't be there." And uh, uh, the, the and textual the, variant. I was going to ask you about that. I was wondering if we should mention the textual variant issue because it opens up a whole can of worms that you may not want to sidetrack. Um, you know the discussion, but. Absolutely. Because if you start talking about textual criticism with the Church of Christ who wants nothing to do with church history and, and the, the manuscript tradition of how God has preserved his word, what you immediately get is, oh, you're just trying to take out Bible passages that you don't like. Mm. Um, I have heard on one occasion um, a Church of Christ preacher understand that and not want to camp out on Mark 16, 16. But overall, I would say, look, you, you have enough context clues to explain the verse and something that Stephen Boyce has pointed out. I told him I loved him saying this is I believe historically Jesus probably said those words at the end of John's gospel. He said and did so many things that aren't written in the Bible. Um, if they were recorded, the whole world couldn't even contain these things. Hmm. So the fact that this is trying to make it into the manuscript tradition, along with, you know, that passage in John eight, first John five, seven, and all these other ones, these, this specifically was probably said and comes out, you know, or through oral tradition that comes back in the text. But when you're in, when you're talking with church of Christ, I would say, treat this verse historically as though Jesus said it, because he probably did. And this verse gives us enough context to actually explain the meaning. There. Okay.